And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, on November 7th of the year 1811, you may have heard the name Tecumseh, the Indian chief who created a uh, coalition of tribes to resist white settlement. But anyway, on, on November 7th, 1811, Tecumseh had a younger brother who was known as the Prophet, and the Prophet, his younger brother, initiated the Battle of Tippy Canoe. Maybe when you were in history class as a child, you had to learn the slogan, Tippy Canoe and Tyler too, right? And um, that was Benjamin Harrison's, um, man, campaign slogans have come a long way since those days. But, but uh, anyway, the, um, the Prophet, Tecumseh's younger brother initiated this battle of Tippy Canoe. The prophet was well regarded as a spiritual leader among the Indian Confederation that his brother had assembled. And before the battle of Tippy Canoe, this prophet had convinced, he, he, he convinced his followers that he had had a vision and the spirits were going to render the white man's weapons to be ineffective. In other words, the bullets, they won't kill you. There is nothing that they can do to harm our warriors. But then, after a two-hour battle, many of the Indian warriors had indeed been killed, and they lost the battle. The prophet's warriors retreated and fled the scene, and Benjamin Harrison won the Battle of Tippy Canoe. The prophet, after that battle, lost all of his spiritual influence. I wish it would work that way in America whenever a false prophecy is made, but apparently Native Americans were smarter than us. But um, anyway, why did, the Native, why did the Native warriors fail in that battle? Well, there are many possible reasons, but one glaring problem for them was that they thought they were engaged in a spiritual battle, but they soon discovered that the battle was indeed quite physical. And... Uh, as believers in Christ, we, all, we often find ourselves in the opposite circumstance. We think we're engaged in a physical battle when, in reality, the battle that we are engaged in is quite spiritual. There are convincing evidences that we mistakenly believe that the battle is, is physical. Things that, that show... If we examine our lives in our culture, we may see that, uh, yes, there is, here's some evidence that we believe wrong. We, we sort of think of the, the battle as a physical battle, even though we don't say it that way. One evidence is that we believe that victory is achieved in the physical world. There's a physical victory. Is, is victory in the Christian life, in the spiritual battle, is victory political? Is... Victory financial. Is victory to be found? Where is it to be found? The ballot box? The courtroom? Is it found in Facebook arguments? Is victory found in freedom or in personal peace? No, these are all physical things. These are all, these are all maybe there are victories there, but not in our main, not in our main battle. Another evidence that we believe the enemy is physical, that we're in a physical battle sometimes is that we, re we think the enemy is physical. Not only do we look for a physical victory, but we look to fight a physical enemy. Who is our enemy? Who is the enemy of, of the Christian? June is Pride Month. Is our enemy the homosexual community? No. They're not our enemies. Is are, are the liberals our enemies? How about the press? How about reporters? How about lawyers? Are negative people our enemies? Are atheists our enemies? What about Muslims? Are Muslims our enemies? No. No. These people are not the enemy. They are the mission field. They are souls for whom Christ died. And victory is achieved not when we prove our argument right or when we win at the ballot box, but victory is achieved every time a believer stands in the face of temptation without sinning and without compromising. And he stands as he shows the grace and love of Christ to a lost and dying world. That is where victory is found. And I'm not saying we shouldn't vote. 
or we shouldn't take a stand for what is right in our culture. But I am saying that the victory we are seeking is not a victory over people, but it's a spiritual victory, and people are not the enemy. They are the mission field. And God is glorified in us when we share the love of Christ without compromise. And we, we, um, we share the gospel with lost and dying souls that hear the pure gospel of Christ, and the, which is the power of God unto salvation. That is victory. There is no other battle and there is no other objective for us. We are engaged in a spiritual warfare. What does God want for you in this spiritual warfare? What is God's plan for you in the spiritual battle? And as we've worked our way through the book of Ephesians, we're coming to the close of it, we find that the Lord calls us many things in this book. In Ephesians, the believer is called God's adopted child in chapter 1. He's called, we're called saints, the holy ones of God in chapter 1 and verse 1 and chapter 4 and verse 12. We're called members of the body of Christ in chapter 1 verses 22 and 23. We're called a new creation created unto good works, chapter 2 and verse 10. We're called a member, we're called members of the household of God, chapter 2 and verse 19. We're called a holy temple, the habitation of God's Spirit in chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. We're called partakers of God's promise in Christ, chapter 3, verse 6. Um, we're called a member of the family in heaven. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God, aren't you? Uh, chapter 3, verse 15. We're called people who are completely forgiven of all sin, chapter 1 and verse 7 in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In chapter 4 and verse 32 also. And we're called dear children of God, chapter 5 and verse 1. We're called people greatly loved by Christ, chapter 5 and verse 2. We're called a light in the Lord and, and children of light, chapter 5 and verse 8. We're called the bride of Christ, chapter 5. And verses 22 through 32, we're called servants of Christ, chapter 6 and verse 6. But when we get to chapter 6 and verse 10 through 20, we are called soldiers. Soldiers of Christ. A soldier? You say, wait a second, I didn't sign up for an army. I don't want to fight. Well, tough. The battle is on and you have been drafted and you can't hide in the foxhole while the battle rages. The enemy will charge the line and find you. Doesn't being a Christian bring us peace? Well, yes and no. Yes, it brings us peace because you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5.1 teaches us that. But if two parties are at war and you make peace with one of them, what does that action do to your relationship with the opposing party? Makes you enemies. Puts you in conflict. James chapter 4 and verse 4 says, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And you could flip that around. Whoever be the friend of God is the enemy of the world. In Matthew 10 and verse 34, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. John 16, verse 33, Jesus elaborates on this a little bit. He says, These things have I spoken unto you that, ye might, uh, that, that in me ye might have peace. So in Christ we have peace with God. But then he says, In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Did you hear that? In the world we will have peace. No. In the world we will have tribulation, conflict, battle, persecution. But Jesus didn't end the conversation there. He said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And so we are in a spiritual warfare and Christ has overcome the world. What does he want for you? What does he want for me? in this spiritual warfare. He doesn't leave us in the dark to guess his intentions in this matter. And so God inspired Paul to write his objective for us 
at the close of this letter to the Ephesians, he gives specific instructions for the objective, and we're going to find that objective and the instructions in, in Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to begin in verse 10 and read. We're going to read through verse 17. We're really going to focus on verses 10 through 13 this morning, but for the full context, and we'll get through uh, this whole section as we read. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of, dark, of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand." Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shed with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. In verses 10 through 13, I want to focus on that this morning, we are... We're, we're given God's purpose for spiritual warfare and God's purpose for us in the midst of the battle. What is that purpose? What does God want for you? Why has He conscripted you? Why has He conscripted me into this spiritual fight? God designs total victory for you in spiritual warfare. That's His desire God wants us to fight to win. What's the point of going to war if you aren't fighting to win? Would anybody go to war and say, you know what, I want to lose. I, I would rather not survive this battle. No. No one goes to war thinking that way. God designs total victory for you in the spiritual war. In verse 11, he says, put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. I want you to take special notice of two important words. Actually, one word repeated twice in verse 11 verse 13. It's the word that. That's an important word. The word that indicates purpose. It, it means that one thing is done in order that a specific purpose may result from it. Here, the Holy Spirit tells us to put on the whole armor of God in order that we may be able to stand. That's the purpose for the armor of God. To enable us to stand against the attack of the devil. Why does a soldier put on armor? For, for protection, for battle, right? Uh, he, put, he doesn't put on armor to go to sleep, take a siesta. He, he, goes, uh, he, he puts on armor for battle. And, and uh, what does it mean in this context to stand? Well, the word stand, it, the, the word that's translated stand in the Koine Greek, it, it's a term used in the military sense to indicate either to take over or to hold a watch post or to stand and hold a critical position on the battlefield. That's what it means to stand. To, to, you know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like victory. It sounds like winning. During the Civil War, the, the Battle of Gettysburg, the Confederate attempt to take Cemetery Hill proved to be the key to the entire battle. Um, in fact, someone had said it was the high watermark of the Confederacy. From that point on, it was one long retreat. The, the position called Cemetery Hill controlled a network of roads from which General Lee intended to turn the flank of the Union Army. It was very important, and General George Meade, the night before the attack, correctly guessed that what Lee's plan and strategy was, and he was ready. The fateful assault on Cemetery Hill is known as Pickett's Charge, and it failed miserably. The Confederate assault force received over 50% casualties and fled. The Union 
won that battle because they were able to stand against the enemy attack upon their position. And they held that position without retreat. They did not give up the ground that the enemy wanted to capture. Years later, someone asked Gen General George Pickett why his charge at Gettysburg had failed so badly. He replied, I've always thought the Yankees had something to do with it. <laughs> to stand in battle means to win the victory. To not give up the ground that the enemy wants to take from you. Or to keep the ground that you have taken from the enemy. That's what God wants for you in spiritual warfare. God designs victory for you. Total victory in this spiritual warfare. Because, and because God wants you to win, He gives us some clear instructions for victory. What are His commands? What are His directives to us? First of all, God commands you to be alert to the enemy. He commands you to be alert to the enemy. In uh, uh, Any soldier who falls asleep on guard duty has failed his commander. Indeed, he's failed his entire, uh, his entire post. And any soldier who cannot identify the enemy in battle is worthless. Even worse than that, he is a detriment to the cause if he cannot identify the enemy in battle. Be alert to the enemy. God commands it. Here in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, we see this command to be alert to the enemy. And, and uh, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Here, Paul uses, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he uses the term wrestle. And it carries with it the idea of hand-to-hand -hand conflict in battle. Back then, of course, they didn't have guns. And so a lot of battle was done that way, hand-to-hand. -hand. I praise God to be born in modern America and not have to do that kind of stuff, right? Um, also, I did not sign up for the Army of the Marines because I didn't want to do that kind of stuff, right? Um, but... Who is this enemy with which we wrestle? We are in conflict and do combat. Notice who our enemy is not. It says right here who is not the enemy. Our enemy is not physical. It says not flesh and blood. You see that? That's why I can say with confidence that, that uh, the liberals, the homosexual community, the atheists, the Muslims are not our enemies. All right? Because they're people. They're flesh and blood. And so under, under this category, under what Paul is saying here, or what the Holy Spirit tells us, our enemy is not flesh and blood. Now there are people who will oppose you as a Christian. They are physical and they are flesh and blood. And they may cause you real distress and sorrow and pain, but they are not the enemy. They are the mission field. The Apostle Paul... He seemed like an enemy to the church, didn't he? He persecuted the church, even some to death. He dragged women and children to jail. Why? Because they went to church. Because they trusted in Christ. But Paul was not the enemy. He was a lost soul, and then Christ saved him. And he became, well, he wrote this, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you who is is not your enemy. Any person who persecutes you, makes fun of you, gives you a hard time, yes, they're a pain, but they're not the enemy. Um, Jesus said, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Before that, he had said, love your enemies. He's not saying people that you consider to be your enemies, but people who act like an enemy to you consider you to be an enemy. Um, but, he, but are these the actions of, of an enemy? Bless, do good, and pray for them. Are those the actions of an enemy? <laughs> no. All right? Uh, why? Because though these people, may, maybe a person acts like an enemy to you, but they are not. They are flesh and blood. Human beings aren't enemies. They're the mission field. Now let me show you who the enemy is. All right? He is... Uh, he is the one who literally, who really attacks us. In verse 11, 
we are told to put on the whole armor of God so we can stand against the wiles of the Democrats. What? No? Oh, I'm sorry. So we can stand against the wiles of the devil. The devil. His schemes, his battle plan is aimed against the Christian. His wiles are what we must stand against. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 and 9 says, Be sober, be vigilant. There's that command to be alert. Because your adversary, who's your enemy? This guy, all right? Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Who's your adversary? The devil. What does he want you, what does he want to do to you? He wants to devour you, to destroy you, to completely take you out of the battle so that you can no longer fight effectively, so that the gospel cannot be a, a, accomplished in your life to bring more souls to Christ. What are we to do? Verse 9 says, Whom resists steadfast in the faith? We are to resist him. But Satan is not alone in his fight. He employs a host of demons who fight for him. Satan's forces are highly organized. They're effective. And they control the course of this world. In verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 6, it says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against who? Against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Now we don't need, excuse me, it take forever and we don't really need to go into all the details on each one of these descriptors because really the text does not expound it very much. It just kind of gives us the fact of it. But we can see from this description that Satan's army has power and it has worked its way into places, into high places of influence. And our battle is against spiritual wickedness in high places of authority in this world. You see, Satan is the god of this world. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, the Bible says, The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. There you see um, Satan's position. He's the, the God of this world. He's controlling the, the culture, the the, 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 the course of this world, and you see his objective to blind the minds of unbelievers so that they will not receive the gospel. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, we realize that, that every believer, every Christian was once under the spell, under the influence of this God of this world. And in, in, he says, wherein in times past, talking to Christians who were now saved, but he says, in times past, ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You know why flesh and blood people act like our enemies? Because they are walking according to the prince of the power of the air, and it is his spirit that is now working in them, the children of disobedience. But still, they are not our enemies. They are our mission field. That's why in the movies, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. That's why in the movies, they only desecrate Jesus' name. You ever notice that? They only desecrate Jesus' name. The world leaves the other religions alone, and they turn all their guns on Christ and on His church. Why? Because the God of this world has blinded their minds and controls this world system. And so, we cannot make an allegiance with this world. The soldier, the United States soldier, goes to battle and makes a special deal with the enemy to be friendly with them. Is he a good soldier? No, he's a traitor, right? We cannot make allegiances with this world. John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is what? It is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of 
the world. And James said, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whoever will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. Make no allegiance with this world. That's what the Word of God is telling us. Now, God has designed for His soldiers to stand against the world and against the flesh and against the devil, but people are not the enemy. In John chapter 17, Jesus is praying before He would go to the cross. John 17 is the high priestly prayer of Jesus when He, when he brought His disciples in intercessory prayer before God the Father and He prayed for them. And we, we see His heart in this prayer for us believers. He says this to His Father, I have given them Thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now listen to this. I pray, says Jesus, not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. You see, we are not of the world, but we are in the world. We're not of the world, but Jesus does not desire to take us out of the world. Rather, he has designed that we should stay in the world, speaking the truth of the gospel in love to lost and dying souls. Not compromising with the world's schemes and direction and standards, but showing them the love and the power of Christ. Satan and his minions are the enemy. People are the mission field. And for victory, God commands us to be alert to this enemy so that we're not taking shots at the wrong target. So that we're not focused on the wrong objective, but that we are um, in the Lord's design for our victory. We, we are, are fighting the proper enemy, the, the real enemy. The Lord's design for our victory encompasses, though, one more command. Not just to be alert to the enemy, but God also commands you to be prepared for the battle. To be prepared for the battle. A soldier who's not prepared is ready to lose. Um, be prepared to do battle with this particular enemy. I know, um, I don't know a whole lot about soldiering. Uh, some of you have done that. And you know a lot more about it than I do. So I tread on broken ground here. But when you're going to a certain place in the world for a, a battle... For instance, if you were going to fight desert warfare, would you train in Alaska? No. Why? Because you're not going to do battle with, with Russians. All right? You're not going to do battle in that type of an environment with that type of enemy. Right? Um, and so usually, I know when, when we would go out to visit uh, Todd and Debbie out in 29 Palms, the, the, the the base there, the, actually it was a joint military base, I believe that's where they did a lot of their desert warfare training. Why? Because it was a desert. All right? You would go to the desert to train for the desert. All right? And so we ought to be prepared to fight this particular enemy, the spiritual enemy. So many times Christians are preparing and prepared and, and are prepared really to only fight people. Only to fight against their own mission field. To tear down and to, and to uh, build themselves up. Don't be prepared for the wrong enemy. Be prepared for battle with this enemy. Don't be surprised by a fight. Don't be off your guard and, oh, I can't believe it. There's an attack from Satan. I, can't, I never thought this would ever happen to me. God wants us to be on high alert. So how does Satan attack? We're going to be prepared for the battle. How does Satan attack? Well, when Paul came to Ephesus preaching the gospel, and that, and that uh, account is found in Acts chapter 19. And when Paul came to Ephesus preaching the gospel, Satan attacked him through exclusion. Paul began preaching in the synagogue, and for three months he preached in the synagogue, and people were coming to Christ, and and then Paul was kicked out of the synagogue by jealous, unbelieving Jews. And they attacked him through exclusion. He was kicked out of his own community. That's a satanic attack. People did it, but it was a satanic attack. Satan attacked Paul in this ministry by mimicking him. In Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 16, uh, Paul had cast a demon out of someone. And, 
and several apostate Jewish exorcists said, I want to, they said, we want in on this action. They tried it. Didn't work out so well for them. But uh, there was a false, there was a false religious people mimicking what Paul had done. You know, there's a lot of satanic attack done through false religion, through false religious people trying to claim the name of Christ for their shenanigans. Satan attacks that way. Satan also attacked by physical threat. When Paul came to Ephesus, many people were coming to the gospel, Demetrius, and, and the other idol makers of that city found that their profit margins were, were getting slimmer because people were bringing their books and having a bonfire with their pagan magic books. They were throwing away their idols and not buying more. And, and so these, these silversmiths, these led by Demetrius, started a riot against the Christians to intimidate them. Against Paul in particular, when we fight for Christ by giving out the gospel, we can expect that Satan will get defensive and launch a counterattack. He does so against churches. And just when a church uh, starts to, to really do a work for God, maybe discouragement hits. Maybe sin hits in the midst of the congregation. Or maybe some kind of division. But Satan will attack because we're his enemy. Be ready for that. Be alert. But I want to show you another way in which Satan attacks, and he attacks individuals. And this is really the blueprint he uses in Genesis chapter 3. We find Satan taking on the form of a subtle serpent and attacking Eve. In verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree in which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And then the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree, a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also to her husband, and he did eat, and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. The attack here described by Satan shows us that he attacks by stealth, by deception, by schemes. He uses the term in our text, the wiles of the devil. See, a good war tactician will employ deception, and Satan is the master of this. Uh, be ready for battle. Sin is always a spiritual thing. How does Satan tempt us to sin? How does he attack you specifically? Here's one way he does it. Here's how he did it with Eve. He convinces us to stop looking at all the good things that God has given to us so that we may focus on one thing that God says we cannot have. Satan comes to Eve and he says, did God really say that you can't have every tree? Now, there was probably, I'm just going to guess here, there's probably thousands tens of thousands or millions of trees in the Garden of Eden bearing fruit that they could eat of. And what a blessing those were. And yet, Satan says, focus on this one tree. You can't have it. Focus on that one tree. Satan works that way and gets you to even though He's given you so many blessings and, and has given you peace with God and eternal life, but He's going to find that one thing and He knows how to press your buttons. He knows what you want that you shouldn't have. And He's going to say, focus all of your life, all of your attention on this one thing. And all of a sudden, you don't see all the other trees in the garden. You can only see this one. And then, when Satan's got you focused on that, then he lies about the seriousness of sin's consequences. Verse 4, ye shall not surely die. 
gets you focused on that one thing, and then he says, you know what? Eh, maybe something bad will happen. I don't know, but it ain't going to be that bad. But by the time you're done with sin, or it's done with you, it can tear your whole life to shreds. And, and by the way, Eve surely died. Next, Satan lies about God's motives for denying us that one thing that he's got us to focus on. In verse 5, he says, For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing both good and evil. Satan is saying, look, uh, God has selfish motives for this prohibition. He knows that if you eat from this tree, you're going to be more like him. You're going to be wise. You're going to know good and evil. Right now, you only know good. And, and God doesn't want you to have this knowledge. God doesn't want you to, to satisfy this desire. God doesn't want that because God is not really good. If God were good, he would know that you would be made happy to have this one thing. And, and then he would not deny that to you. If he, he would give you what you really want if God was really good. You see, every sin is actually a lack of faith in God's good character. But God commands us to be prepared for this battle. And He enables us to be prepared for it. He enables us to go to battle. In verse 10, He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. God gives us two directives by which we may be ready for spiritual battle. The first directive is be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Be strong. The second directive is put on the whole armor of God. So he says be strong. How do you be strong? How do we be strong in the Lord? The key to God's strength is your weakness. The key to God's strength is your weakness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Paul is relating a problem that he had, and he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me. The word buffet means literally to beat me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And so he's saying, I'm being persecuted by Satan. There's something physical going on in my life, but it's a result of Satan. He says in verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. I prayed, he said, to be healed. I prayed for this, for this temptation, this, this, this torment to go away. And the answer was no. God did not take it away. And here's God's answer, verse 9. He said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul would go on to say, most gladly, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and necessities and persecutions in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. To be strong in the Lord, to, op to operate in the power of His might, don't trust yourself to be strong enough to flirt with sin and temptation. Don't trust your own strength. Rely heavily on God's Word. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Read it every day. Depend on it. Obey it. Love it. Don't do without God's Word. Make time for it. Make it a priority. And see, when we are trusting in our own flesh, in our own self, we say, well, I can make it for a few days. I can make it for a while. Pray without ceasing. Jesus says, watch and pray lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? It's weak. Be committed to the body of Christ, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching, we need the mutual exhortation of the saints. Be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. Confess and forsake sin. This is how we totally rely on God's power in the battle. Fox News will not help you. Talk radio will let you down. And the latest celebrity to go on a 
television awards show and give a watered down version of the gospel without mentioning Christ's repentance or the cross will not help you. Will not strengthen you. You see, the key to God's strength is your weakness. The key to God's strength is not the size of the church that you go to. It is not getting the majority of people in America to agree with the Christian life. The, the key to God's strength is your weakness. You say, do I have to become weak? No, you are weak. Do I have to become weak? No, I am weak. I am. We just have to admit it. And then trust God's strength. God designs total victory for you in spiritual battle. Victory over sin. Victory over the fear that stops you from sharing the gospel. Victory in pressing on and pressing forward where God has given you influence in this community, in your, in your contacts, to present the gospel to others, to live the gospel, the light uh, that shines in you. That is the victory that He commands. But He commands us to be alert to the enemy and be prepared for the battle. To be strong in the Lord and to trust in His power. And the second part of that preparation is to put on the whole armor of God, which we will address next week. Let me ask you this. Do you know we're in a spiritual battle? Are you winning? Or are you losing spiritual battles? Are you finding victory or defeat? Are you advancing or are you giving ground? And what are you doing about it? Are you, in your mind, fully engaged in the spiritual battle that rages around us? Let's stand together and